So a very good afternoon to Associate Prof. Dr. Kadul Ismail, Dr. Munawar Hatta, Dr. Nis Azlan, Dr. Ruth Sabrina, and also our panelists, Associate Prof. Dr. Muhammad Hashari Fauzi, Dr. Yor Blasment, and also Dr. Hassan Adam, and to all doctors and the final year medical students in attendance. So my name is Hashim, and along with my friend Shrida. Okay, so welcome to the third series of the Clinical Toxinology Webinar this year, organized by the Emergency Medicine Department of Hospital Chancellor Tuan Kumung Chris, in collaboration with the College of Emergency Physicians Special Interest Group in Clinical Toxinology, Remote Envenomation Consultancy Services, and Malaysia Society of Toxinology. Right, so in this webinar and forum, we aim to explore the topic of clinical toxinology. Is it relevant to medical students? So to deliver our opening remarks, we would like to invite Dr. Nick Azlan bin Nick Mahmoud, lecturer and emergency medicine specialist here in UKM with a focus in trauma resuscitation, pre-hospital care and musculoskeletal. Without further ado, Prof. The Mick is yours. Hello, assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to all um, lecturers, professors, students. Um, so the opening remark about this um, uh, lecture is that actually um, the medical student attachment emergency department right. in um, in PPUKM is a two weeks um, um, attachment and. Um, in emergency only is a time or the place where we can actually cover part of the toxinology or toxicology because uh, it's a part of the, the subspecialty of emergency and uh, most likely wouldn't be covered anywhere else. So in this uh, two week stint of uh, covering emergency, everything under the sun of emergency, uh, resuscitation, trauma resuscitation, uh, triaging, um, it's very good if we can um, put a bit a part of the um, toxinology and toxicology uh, inside the syllabus of uh, wide syllabus of emergency. So, um, without uh, further ado, I'd like to um, um, open this um, this uh, very important and very uh, fruitful discussion and ceremony seminar. Thank you, Dr. Nick. All right. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. Uh, do use our Zoom background if you're planning to turn on your video. Uh, there will also be a feedback form at the end of the webinar to receive your certificate of participation. And feel free to ask any questions through our Zoom Q&A through the chat box. We will be checking our chat box from now and then. And all your questions will be addressed at the end of every case. Okay. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, joining us today, we are very, very grateful to have the panel of experts. So first up, we have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Mohammad Hashairi Fauzi. He is a senior lecturer and consultant at the Emergency Physician School of Medical Sciences, USM, Malaysia. He is also a vice president of Society of Critical and Emergency Sonography in Malaysia, SUCCES, as well as a fellow in emergency and critical care ultrasound, Win Focus International. He had clinical and research interests in emergency ultrasound and emergency critical care. He is actively involved as an instructor in various fields of interest, including advanced offshore trauma and medical AOTM, difficult airway management in emergency med med medicine and first aid course. He is also holding a few uh, research grants and published number of articles either national and international level, and actively has collaborated with Critical Care Research Group, CCRG, in Brisbane, Australia. So welcome, Prof. So next up, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jörg Desmond from Germany. Dr. Jörg is a medical doctor specialized in internal medicine, infectious disease, and public health. He worked as a post doctoral scientist and is currently the head of the research group Snakebite and Venomy at Bernhard Notch Institute of Tropical Medicine in Hamburg, Germany. The focus of his work in the field of toxinology is epidemiology of snake bites and the respective snakes, clinical studies, training of medical doctors and nurses in management of snake bites patients, and also community education in Laos, Vietnam, in Southeast Asia, as well as Ghana and Gabon in Africa. So welcome, doctor. Good morning, Doctor. All right. Uh, finally, 
Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hassan Adam. He is an emergency medicine specialist at Ripas Hospital Brunei since 2013. So he was an emergency resident at Emergency Department of University Malaya from 2008 to 2013. He graduated from Al Ghazira's University in Sudan and then proceeded to complete, complete his master's in emergency medicine, MEM Med, in University Malaya, Malaysia. He also completed his fellowship in F uh, FACEE as well as MTOX, Emergency Toxicology, in 2018 in India. He has a special interest in all aspects of toxinology. So warm welcome to you, Doctor. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. All right, so next up. Uh, we will be providing a brief introduction to our fellow final year undergraduate medical students on the topic of clinical toxinology. So I'll begin. Um, first, we'll start with what is the difference between toxinology and clinical toxinology? So toxinology is the scientific study of substances produced by living organisms either delivered as venom and residing within tissues of animals, plants, mushrooms, and bacteria, which may harm target organisms. And then we have clinical toxinology, which basically encompasses a broad range of medical conditions resulting from either envenomation by venomous terrestrial and marine organisms or poisoning from ingestion or of animal or plant toxins. Okay, so next we will explore the difference between envenomation and poisoning. So envenomation is basically the exposure to venom containing toxins resulting from bites or stings from venomous animals. However, Poisoning is the administration of a poison which contains a natural toxin inside one's body via a swallowing or inhalation or any absorption through the skin. Okay. So these are some of the various uh, organiz organizations in Malaysia that work regarding toxinology in Malaysia. So first we have MSD, which is the Malaysian Society on Toxinology, which was first established in 1992. We also have Remote Envenomation Consultancy Services, RESCS, uh, which was first established in 2010, which is basically a risk management support system for healthcare workers in terms of clinical management of envenomation as well as poisoning. So we also have Clinical Toxinology as IG in College of Emergency Physicians, EP. We also have Malaysian Biodiversity Information System as well as National Poison Center. So thank you, Shrida. So I will continue with the importance of clinical toxinology for medical students. So why is it important, especially as an undergraduate student, as such as a final year medical student, uh, just like me and all my uh, fellow friends? So it is because toxinology is very common in Malaysia. So it is uh, involved a life-threatening event, and also we need an emergency care uh, while dealing with this uh, scenario. So when is the best time to learn uh, clinical toxinology? So uh, there is a three major uh, department that can uh, uh, dealing with uh, emergency care, especially in toxinology. For example, in emergency medicine, where patient come in emergency condition. Also in family medicine, where the uh, general practitioner will uh, see the patient uh, during the first place. And also in internal medicine, where patient will be referred after a stabilization in ED, and then we for, uh, for continue um, of care in the internal medicine. So I have a few questions that I would like to ask for uh, the doctor and prof, which is my first question is, I would like to ask whether doctor or prof have experience of learning clinical toxinology, especially during undergraduate studies. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, thank you so much, uh, Srida and Hash uh, Hashim. I would like to take this uh, opportunity to thank also Prof. Khaldun, Dr. Ning, and team for inviting or having me here. And of course, uh, I'm very glad also uh, to have our panelists here, uh, expert on this uh, uh, subject. So um, uh, for the question just now, of course, uh, I'm, uh, uh, you know, live in East Coast of Malaysia. I'm from USM. Uh, some of you uh, know about the uh, uh, the location of USM, which is uh, east coast of uh, Peninsula, uh, Peninsula Malaysia. And of course, we are near the border of Thailand. So um, I just want to share, uh, actually, my um, uh, exposure to uh, toxinology during undergrad, basically, is very limited. So very limited, uh, because at uh, that time, uh, the uh, immunity medicine not, uh, I see, not well uh, uh, developed. Uh, so uh, I guess since um, 2000, when 
2002, when there is the uh, image immunity medicine uh, uh, specialties uh, uh, developed. So we slowly, you know, introduced this topic. And I have to admit that uh, during my undergrad days, uh, you know, we have just uh, uh, the, the, the term of uh, toxicology is more uh, compared to the uh, uh, toxinology. You know, uh, and then the uh, of course we know we know about the snip by, uh, but it's not the you know a regroup uh, under uh, toxi toxinology. Sometimes we put under under you know they mix the the topics, not uh, really structured uh, teaching uh, in uh, toxinology. But now I I, I think uh, since uh, immunity medicine uh, well uh, established, so we here in USM uh, we have for four weeks uh, immunity medicine posting for year five uh, undergrad and of course we uh, had the um, structured topic on the uh, uh, toxicology as well as the uh, toxinology yeah there's uh, some uh, introduction yeah thank you thank you Prof. Uh, what about dr hassan or dr yo all right uh, thank you uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to join such a wonderful and uh, very dynamic uh, uh, topic. Uh, in regard to your question, whether or not I have encountered any kind of toxinology during my medical school, uh, pretty much sure I haven't even heard of it. Uh, though uh, the a uh, university that I have uh, graduated in uh, basically is like a very uh, community-based, community-oriented uh, kind of uh, medical studies. Uh, just to give you a glimpse of it, um, during your or during our uh, last two years, uh, we have to get into some sort of uh, a course. Uh, they call it interdisciplinary. So basically that uh, interdisciplinary course is like very community based. Uh, the student at that time, we uh, grouped into a group of probably each group has five or 10. And then we will be allocated into one village nearby the town that uh, hosting our university. So this is almost two years uh, course. Uh, yes. That is a rural area. Yes, they have bites. Yes, they have stings. But yet, uh, doesn't uh, kind of grasp our attention at that time because, uh, as uh, uh, the doctor said earlier, the idea of bites and stings all come under the umbrella of uh, just uh, general medicine. So there is no uh, specific um, entity for it. Um, by the end of the medical school, yes, we start to read about toxicology, not toxinology. And um, that is why uh, I could say the uh, idea of toxinology pretty much uh, new for us. Um, and I would be uh, very honest if I, if I have told you that uh, probably I might have heard of it probably a few years ago. And up to a few years ago, I, I do feel that the toxinology is like just kind of synonymous to toxicology. But uh, thanks God, uh, we get involved here and we get to know that there is a difference. And I do believe this is pretty much a relevant uh, topic to the students, medical students, and much relevant to the medical fields. So thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, what about Dr. York? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. To Malaysia, good morning from Germany. Um, I don't remember that I learned anything in toxinology during my medical studies in Germany, but of course, I, we are living here, or we are here in an area of temperate climate, so the number of venomous snakes is very limited. And uh, the only one we have here is Viparaberos, uh, a wiper which is uh, uh, present in the northern part of uh, Europe, especially also in the northern part of uh, Germany. 
when I was first confronted with a case uh, of Viparaberos bite here in, in our Tropical Institute clinic, uh, that was uh, in 2003. And uh, I remember everybody was a little bit uh, overburdened with, uh, with this case. Nobody really know, knew how to uh, deal with these kind of uh, snake bites. Of course, <clears throat> deeper arborous bites usually uh, are not life-threatening, so the patient uh, recover anyway, whatever we do as medical doctors. But anyway, I think uh, it is also important to include this here in medical studies. Actually, I don't know uh, about the, the, the curriculum in Germany at this time, uh, but I can imagine that clinical toxinology is uh, very limited uh, uh, in, in our curriculum uh, at this time and should be improved too. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. York. So maybe we can... Uh... Ask uh, if there is uh, other doctors want to give uh, a talk uh, regarding experience as an undergraduate student. Well, uh, from my experience uh, as, as 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 a medical students, um, when I was studying, I was in Ireland, and Ireland is known uh, to be sort of free of snakes. So I never encountered any snake bites during my undergraduate years. Uh, or when I was working uh, in Ireland. Uh, but when I came back, um, I had a bit of a shock in my life when we encounter a snake bite and I have no idea of how to manage it because I had no uh, experience before encountering a snake bite or even snakes. So uh, that kept me um, thinking of, uh, you know, uh, there must be something uh, which is really lacking in terms of uh, managing such cases in tropical Malaysia at that time. You know, we are a tropical country, but uh, we, we, we have all these animals, very interesting, beautiful, but venomous animals. And we have no good grabs of really a guide, a good guide to, to manage it, or even to call for someone uh, for help uh, if we have encountered such cases. So I learned through the hard way uh, making a lot of mistakes in my uh, early years and in, in doing or in looking at clinical toxinology. But uh, because of that, uh, we, we keep on uh, improving and we come up with a lot of um, guidelines. We provide a lot of support. Uh, we learn with, uh, with every case that we encounter and being con consulted. Uh, we are also learning at the same time. So uh, so that's where we were. We only started such an endeavor in 2010, as you rightly mentioned, Rex was first started in 2010, but uh, officially in 2012. So you're still very young, it's, you know, just 11 years, uh, 13 years old that we have started this. And uh, But uh, because of that, because of so many challenges, uh, uh, we are able to make a lot of uh, advancement and therefore a lot of achievements as well. So that's a good thing uh, when we encounter, especially you guys, young doctors, to be, if you encounter something which are not really clear uh, or still not established, uh, don't just keep quiet. Uh, please pursue, uh, pursue the, your, your, you know, the, 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 the uh, keep on asking questions and look for the answers and maybe you will actually develop, uh, you have the opportunity to develop a new uh, field uh, that has been neglected for a long time. So, yeah, so that's that's my take on the issue. And I think Dr. York, uh, besides being in Germany, he's also affiliated with Laos and Vietnam. So uh, he's very much Asian as well, <laughs> not just German. <laughs> Yes, that is true. And uh, that was the time I was first confronted with venomous snake bites in, in Laos. And uh, I learned that that is a very interesting topic. For that reason, I also got engaged uh, in this topic in, uh, in uh, uh, Laos and also in Vietnam. Oops. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, it's indeed great to hear because, as you said, we have so many species of venomous 
animals as well as snakes. So uh, we do want to ask a follow-up question to anyone from the floor. Um, when do you feel is the right time to incorporate clinical toxinology into our curriculum? So from an undergraduate itself, or would you feel like it's a more advanced topic? Or Okay, okay. so uh, I guess uh, since the uh, uh, importance of this uh, topic, uh, before this, uh, you know, people not really aware of this, uh, um, uh, I mean, the awareness of, uh, you know, knowing, understand. Uh, we, uh, I think in, in Malaysia, the uh, venomous snack is, is, you know, we receive uh, quite common uh, presentation in our clinical practice. So I think the best time, um, what we do now, uh, we create the uh, awareness among medical students since uh, um, undergrad days. So uh, you know why? Because uh, uh, later you will become a future doctors, and then and then uh, during your housemanship, you know, of course you will encounter this kind of cases. And uh, uh, but we are very fortunate nowadays. I think Prof Haldun and team uh, created a very very um, you know, good networking for consultation. Even me still learning. Uh, some type of snake, I also don't know. <laughs> so is it venomous or non-venomous? Last time, all snake bite for me is venomous. So, <laughs> so now those uh, non-venomous, we can discharge from ED straight away. So uh, because of now the stranded, uh, you know, overcrowding ED, the uh, stranded ward, you know. So uh, it, it's good uh, decision when we just uh, snake, with the snake ID, I guess, uh, we can discharge patient home with, with, the, with the advice. So uh, we are very, again, I think we are very uh, 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 fortunate with this uh, great effort. So I think the, the awareness should start from the undergrad days. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, maybe from my side, uh, I would also say we can start very early. I think you can start with undergrad or already first aid. Of course, you will do this very early. And, and first aid is a very important uh, part of, of uh, clinical toxinology for snake bites and other uh, venomous uh, or other envenomings. And of course, also then in, 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 in undergraduate studies in physiology, pathophysiology, uh, you can also start understanding the action of uh, venom uh, uh, in the humans. Uh, and then uh, further in pharmacology, you can include clinical toxinology, uh, the, the action of antivenom and how to apply antivenom, how to, how to uh, produce antivenom that is part of, of pharmacology. And then, of course, uh, in clinical medicine, which uh, clinical toxinology is, will, will be part in emergency medicine. It will be part of surgery when you uh, think about uh, the, the infections and, and, and uh, cytotoxic effects of, of venoms, ICU medicine, internal medicine. So that is uh, all part. Uh, toxinology will be part of all these uh, subjects. So I agree with Dr. Yong just now because uh, it is important for us, especially undergraduate students, we are the future healthcare providers. So at least we need to have understanding uh, in terms of this toxinology because we are the future doctor and we will um, face this kind of uh, condition uh, in, uh, in the future as well. So it's also important because uh, early exposure will be benefit us in terms of awareness as well. So maybe we can have a few words from Dr. Uh, Hassan Adam for the... Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you for giving me the chance. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, the uh, toxinology would be much uh, helpful, much uh, practical if uh, being integrated into the early years of uh, medical school. Uh, but uh, the flip side is uh, toxinology as uh, a topic. Yes, just the topic, but the contents, it might be varies from one region to another. So for example, if uh, we have to uh, incorporate uh, toxinology into our uh, uh, medical school uh, curriculum, uh, definitely that will be uh, so much different uh, based on the regional um, distribution of the bites and stings. Uh, and stings. And because of that, uh, probably 
uh, the incorporation, it might take a bit of time to see the light. Um, as I have said, there's a regional issues and we do know that uh, different areas, they have their own different things, they have own uh, different uh, bites. But the other issue also, for example, I just want to uh, talk about the, for example, uh, North Africa. Yes, we have a uh, few snakes, we have uh, uh, scorpions, but yet if you look into the mindset of the policymaker there, uh, they have more issues to deal with rather than uh, looking into these pretty much valid uh, medical uh, and urgent issues. So because of that, uh, yes, it might be some part of the world, it might uh, start incorporating this uh, concept into their uh, medical schools, but yet probably at the other side of the world, uh, it might lag behind. Uh, simply because of the reason that I have uh, mentioned. But uh, by the end of the day, yes, toxinology uh, worth to be incorporated into our medical schools, but we have to look into few details uh, which might uh, uh, serve each region uh, appropriately. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very important point. I think uh, that you said that every region, if you were to look at the curriculum that you want to develop, must be really uh, being specified to your own country's um, so-called uh, fauna and flora uh, or the toxins uh, that may be involved. Uh, but on the flip side as well, there's another issue if let's say the topic has been so-called introduced somewhere else, which is not in your country and you suddenly have uh, new doctors uh, coming into your country and start applying what they know uh, only from the other countries and it doesn't really apply to your own country. That can also be an issue. So if you don't take up uh, the initiative uh, to really uh, look at clinical toxinology in your own uh, country or within your own region, then you get this all kinds of issue which we had faced before where uh, the doctors are applying a uh, snake bite from America, US, from rattlesnake bite for treating snake bite in Malaysia. So that is also causing a lot of problems because uh, obviously they are not applicable in your own country. Another issue that we did encounter because of this lacking of understanding about clinical toxinology is we imported antivenom which is not relevant uh, for our country. So we used to import antivenom from India and to be used in Malaysia, which is completely different species uh, uh, on, on, that, uh, on that note. So uh, for years and uh, until we came along and said that, you know, this is not really a good practice. Uh, you can actually cause a lot of issues of, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody can sue you for giving you the wrong antivenom. So that is very dangerous. Uh, so that's where awareness about your own uh, situation in terms of clinical toxinology uh, is a far greater uh, so-called reach, not just about how to treat snake bite. No, it's, it's a very, uh, it's all about, um, how should I say, providing the best care for the patient. So uh, that's what I, I believe. And that's why I think, uh, like you rightly say, uh, if you were to introduce in your own country, so you need to specify which part of the clinical toxinology, how much you want to introduce, uh, what are the important aspects that you need to, uh, most likely is the principles, uh, which can be applied uh, in a rather broad way. Uh, but for the details, maybe as Dr. Yok said, or Dr. Hashairi said, is actually when, when you are actually uh, maybe doing your uh, residency, when, when you're doing your master's program, so that's where you get into the subspecialty part. So, uh, but for, for the young doctors like you guys, uh, I think it's very important to know that there is such a thing of how to treat snake bite uh, properly in your own country. Uh, you know your own species, not just look at YouTube <laughs> and uh, you know uh, internet like that and take everything from there, uh, which we had already actually you know uh, a lot of issues in the past. Uh, so that's why we produce our own information uh, 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 
and spread it out there to share with you. So uh, if you look at our chat box, I've shared a few uh, uh, video links uh, of our own uh, uh, need, our own, uh, what you call, addressing our own issues. So that is very, very important. And I think that's where uh, for you guys as a young medical doctors uh, later on, uh, you have a good footing, you have a good basic uh, for you to start off not just, you know, at a loss like what I had experienced before when I was first as a medical student coming from Ireland, you know. So, yeah. So, thank you for that input. So, shall we move on? Thank you for, for the feedback. So, as a representative of uh, undergrad medical students, so it was an eye-opener for us because toxinology is very important, as mentioned by uh, Prof. Shairi just now. Uh, for example, ED, emergency department. So if you can identify which one is the poisonous snake or not, so you can, you can help in terms of uh, reducing um, overwork, uh, especially in ED department. Also, as mentioned by Prof just now, uh, it is uh, important to identify the species based on the country itself. Okay, so maybe we can continue. So uh, next up, we will have four presentation. So after each case, uh, we will invite the panelists for some discussion and followed by short Q&A session. So the audience can drop their queries in the chat box during the uh, case, uh, each case presentation. All right, so moving on to case one. All right, so this case is a 25 year old fisherman with no known medical illnesses with an allergic reaction secondary to an alleged stonefish sting. Okay, so this case happened uh, in February this year. So what happened was at 12.30 p.m. on the 4th of February, 2023, a patient was stung by a stonefish thorn on the tip of his middle finger of his left hand while attempting to remove the fish from his fishing net. So post-trauma, the patient actually complained of generalized urticaria rash, pruritus, left hand swelling associated with numbness and pain with dizziness, nausea, and shortness of breath. So he was presented to ED at 12.46 p.m., 16 minutes post-trauma. So these are the photos of the fish. As you can see, the two pictures with the below that. So it's stonefish. Right, next. Right, so upon arrival to ED, his blood pressure was 170 millimeters mercury. Heart rate was 90, normal. His SpO2 was 100% under room air. His respiratory rate was 19 breaths per minute. Uh, and then his temperature was 36.9 degrees Celsius. And then his pain score at the time was 7 out of 10. So on examination, the patient was alert, not tachypneic, with generalized urticaria. The throat and uvula were not swollen. Cardiovascular, he had dual rhythm and no murmur. Uh, lungs were clear, no ronchi. The abdomen, it was soft and non-tender. Uh, in terms of neurological examination, bilateral upper limb powers were five feet uh, with reduced sensation over the left arm. Reflexes were normal. So we noted one thin sting mark on the tip of his left middle finger with swelling present, as you can see in the picture. So in the next slide, we can see uh, this is his finger with a slight swelling on his left hand. And then the picture on the left, we can see that there is no other swelling noted on the rest of his palm or hand. Okay, so next. Okay, so his management at the time, he was actually discharged with uh, paracetamol and prednisolone for three days, as well as loratidine. And then he was told to come in to the ED uh, stat if the symptoms were persistent or if it wasn't. Uh, all right. Uh uh, obviously, this young uh, gentleman, he seems to be stung with the uh, uh, stonefish. Uh, yes, uh, initial presentation uh, might not show much. Uh, and probably his main issue right now is pain more than, uh, more than some other uh, allergic reaction. Uh, my question would be uh, whether or not this kind of uh, cases warranted to be uh, observed or not. Uh, before I can answer to that, uh, I might uh, need to ask a question. Um, uh, it seems to be this gentleman, he just came a few minutes after the uh, uh, being uh, uh, stepped into that stonefish. Um, how long he has stayed into the ED before being discharged? I believe he spent about an hour in ED and then he was discharged subsequently with uh, the following medications. 
Yeah, okay. So uh, in that case, uh, my intake in this, yes, uh, the, as I have said, the presentation is like quite mild, but uh, sometimes even like seemingly uh, very mild initial presentation can evolve uh, later on uh, when the time passed by. Uh, so that's why the idea of um, kind of observing your patient uh, probably for a couple of hours, we'll see how the pain management wise, yes, he might not be in that distressing pain, but who knows uh, that uh, seemingly mild uh, allergic reaction might uh, progress into something more uh, severe. Um, yes, um, I'm not assuming that I'm pretty much into uh, the knowledge of uh, these uh, marines uh, uh, toxinology, but uh, the common sense of uh, uh, emergency management um, would recommend that uh, we have to be more cautious when it comes to these kind of uh, well-recognized, and it might be at some point of time uh, provoked for more severe allergic reaction, though the initial presentation might just look so mild. Um, so I, my point here is uh, we have to keep at the back of our mind Initial presentation might not reflect what might be the next. Uh, is there any um, history about where the location of incident? Uh, this was in hospital, Sariki. Yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, in terms of the location of incident, where did he get stung? Oh, you mean the distance from shore, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I was it was was the incident in uh, the sea? Uh, how did he get stung? So that's very important, uh, which I yes. think uh, very important information uh, for us clinician, which we usually take for granted. Uh, so uh, we don't focus on those. But if if you are, uh, it is very close to Dr. Hassan. This is a case in Sarawak. Uh, it's, so it's very close to Brunei. So yeah. most of the time, if we talk about stonefish, um, we think of marine, right? We think about a sea. But uh, it's this is something which is unusual that we just noticed recently that uh, stonefish can also be present in this in the river in Sarawak. So this case is actually uh, in Sarike. Uh, Sarike has a big river uh, going out to the to the town. Um, and uh, he was just fishing uh, in the river. So that's how he got stung. Uh, so when he fished out this fish, we were a bit surprised to find that uh, stonefish is also in the river. So usually uh, stonefish, uh, as we know it from Australian, a lot of these cases has been studied in Australia. Uh, the stonefish are actually in the sea and people got stung because they accidentally stepped on the fish. But for us in Malaysia, it's slightly different. We tend to get more, uh, sh should I say, injury uh, related to the hand because we tend to pick up the fish or we actually intend to catch the fish or we actually try to process the fish before we cook the fish. So in Malaysia, this is actually a very delicate and very nice fish to eat actually and quite expensive. So, uh, but the location is very interesting. Uh, it's not just limited to the sea now. So we find that in the big river, uh, close to the uh, uh, to the mouth of the river, uh, such a fish can live quite uh, and and thrive uh, quite well uh, in the muddy uh, bottom of the of the river. So this is something new, kind of a new finding for us. Uh, so uh, this has been acknowledged by the fish experts as well. Uh, in the region from Singapore, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tan. So uh, he also noted a few studies that shows uh, some location upstream of the river where this uh, stonefish can be found. There are several species uh, of stonefish. Yeah? So there, this is very uh, interesting uh, knowledge uh, that we get uh, through the, uh, uh, from our non-medical uh, colleagues. Uh, so this is another interesting about clinical toxinology. Uh, which I find uh, is uh, we cannot work in just medical. As Dr. Hassan said just now, 
if we just look at medical, we tend to fall back to just emergency medicine. But if you look at clinical toxinology, we need to know where the location are, what are the species name, has this been identified before? Is this a new finding? That is all very exciting. So we have to be like, you know, go over uh, our own clinical uh, boundaries. Uh, we have to go uh, and look for what you call uh, uh, translational type of uh, uh, cooperation, right? You know, uh, we have friends in biologists, we have friends as taxonomists. Uh, so those are make, making clinical toxinology very unique in, in a sense. Uh, so we don't just focus on just clinical, even though it's named clinical, but we are towards the end of the whole process of, you know, from identifying the, the species and so on. So, yeah, uh, that's interesting. Any input from Dr. York or Dr. Uh, Prof. Uh, Hushairi? Yeah, yeah, from my side, uh, well, I, I don't have uh, lots of experience with uh, uh, stonefish because Laos is a landlocked country, so we have uh, no stonefish. Or ne I never saw stonefish uh, envenoming there. But what I want to uh, emphasize is uh, with envenoming, we always have to think about allergic reaction. And I think that is very important. That happens with a snake bite, that happens with any other uh stings from bees and so and sometimes we don't think about uh symptoms of allergic reaction and we it sometimes also can mix it up with uh with uh, uh envenoming systemic envenoming symptoms itself so we it's always very important to think about uh, uh, uh allergic uh reactions to the to the venom Um, okay, thank you. Uh, from my side, um, actually, um, Kota Baru, Oklantan, uh, we are nearby the uh, Perhentian Island. Um, so, of course, uh, I think uh, I learned today, uh, not only, most of the time we, we saw this uh, stonefish at the you know, sea, not the river. So, I guess uh, new uh, information to me. Uh, but... Uh, so far, I think our here in 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 our center, not much we uh, dealing with the uh, stonefish. Uh, the, the important, but I just want to emphasize the uh, one of the important um, uh, presentation of stonefish is the uh, 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 severe pain, uh, very painful, so very painful. So um, uh, it might, uh, you know, some patients require some methods of, uh, you know, not only systemic. Uh, analgesic, but uh, we have to do some. Uh, some people mentioned about the uh, hot water uh, immersion. If if we have some uh, refractory pain because of the uh, stonefish, I'm not sure. Maybe Prof. Carl don't have more uh, information about this. Uh, uh, but uh, my experience, we not really have this kind of uh, cases. Uh, we just, you know, uh, most sort of. Uh, patient if from the you know uh, come from the island uh, most of them have their own tips how to manage uh, so they don't come to our MC department uh, most of them I know uh, have their own you know own methods how to uh, uh, manage this uh, this uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, venom but I agree with uh, Dr. Joe and uh, our uh, panel Dr. Hassan that he, we need to also remind uh, uh, ourselves that uh, they can uh, present with the uh, allergic reaction. Worst case is, uh, you know, uh, I think this patient actually have uh, two system involved now, uh, as with recipe system. So we can see patient having um, anaphylaxis, you know. Uh, so maybe needs some time for uh, observe uh, before the such patient. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I just want to summarize a bit uh, before we move on. Uh, so stonefish management, yes, uh, always when we come to emergency department, we always look at ABC first, deal with those. And if there's generalized eukaryotic that's reflecting some uh, hypersensitivity reaction. So we'll deal with that as well. And of course, pain, then uh, that's where Dr. Haishairi was saying just now, we possibly can consider using hot water immersion. But if we were to use hot water immersion, it's important to do that first before actually initiating any analgesia. Uh, so, because if you do analgesia, patient already uh, having some, uh, you know, chemical suppression of pain on board and you put 
the patient's limb into the hot water, they might actually not feel the pain much because <laughs> of the hot water. So they may actually cause uh, or lead to an injury. So if you were to do hot water immersion, yes, I'm, I agree. There's a possibility for it to be used as early intervention for pain in marine stings. Uh, so uh, you should apply that first before you give any analgesia, especially if you have already started considering uh, uh, what you call local anesthetic. So, mm -hmm. so if you start local anesthetic, there's no point doing hot water immersion because yeah. <laughs> that will actually, patient will not, you know, uh, uh, will not feel the pain anymore. So uh, this is another thing that we and we actually in the emergency department, uh, before we do certain intervention, we have to see whether it is actually logical to use or not logical to use anymore. So uh, this is all about patient safety, right? We're talking about patient safety. So uh, just be aware about that. And yes, I agree with Dr. Hassan. Uh, the pain uh, this patient have is uh, uh, initially quite mild, but I think it went to eight, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this was controlled with uh, the analgesia provided. Uh, in Australia, uh, they have actually antivenom for the stonefish, but we don't. Mm. Uh, so uh, for them, uh, in Australia, they will actually use uh, antivenom uh, to uh, control the effect of envenomation. Uh, not so much about like this patient having generous urticaria rash, um, but on the effect of the pain. Uh, so some patients have very intractable pain. So we can give antivenom, the pain actually reduce. So, uh, but we don't have that. So what we have in our arsenal uh, is just uh, analgesia and treat as the patient uh, based on the patient symptoms. So uh, this is a very good, uh, you know, uh, case. Uh, we learn a lot from this case actually. Uh, we never really see much of. Uh, as you said, general uh, allergic reaction from marine sting from fish. Uh, but this case also present, as you said, the two things, uh, envenoming and also the reaction as well. Okay, very good. Shall we move on? Uh, thank you, panelists, for the portfolio uh, session. So we have one uh, question in the chat box asking how long should we uh, monitor the patient as for example, in this patient, patient presented with mild um, allergic reaction. So how long should we put this patient on observation in terms of monitoring the symptom? Uh, anybody, you want to respond to that? Or Hashani? Uh, okay, uh, yes. Uh, my, from uh, my side, I guess because this patient not really get a simple allergic reaction, because a patient also have the uh, shortness, shortness of breath. Uh, so this is very important to, uh, uh, is this patient, to get more further history, is this patient high risk or low risk? I, I mean, high risk mean patient have allergic reaction before, patient asthmatic. So this kind of group we need to, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, observe more. One of yeah. the uh, important points that uh, people talk when we're managing anaphylaxis in general, we worry of the, what they call the bifacic reaction. So uh, the bifacial reaction uh, means that when patient have symptom and we give treatment, patient resolve, but it, it come again. Uh, from the study, there's no specific time, but they say six hours and uh, I mean six hours and above. It's not exact numbers, but uh, we, we can look at the uh, in 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 um, general. But those are high risk, for example, asthmatic patient had the anaphylaxis before. This kind of group may we can uh, observe longer, maybe twenty four hours. It's my 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 opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Radha Hassan, what do you think? You had uh, asked that question just now as well. <laughs> yes, but I think that's a spot on uh, kind of answer. Um, I don't have much to add on it, uh, but uh, I just want to bring the concept of that observe and see. Uh, but for sure, if you uh, lucky enough uh, to have uh, some system in a place like uh, um, RECS, uh, definitely if you pull the line and then definitely they will know uh, this part, this uh, stonefish, how long the, uh, if there is any um, envenomation, how long the venom will last. And based on that, we can tell our observation. But uh, obviously here, it seems to be more towards the uh, anaphylaxis rather than to be envenomation per se. 
Um, but it's, though it's not that 100% uh, definitive, but uh, from the uh, um, anaphylaxis point of view, uh, yeah, we tend to observe uh, six to eight hours. And um, as uh, uh, our panelists said, uh, usually we be watchful for the uh, biphasic reaction and all this. So uh, I think uh, fair enough to be six to eight hours. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, that's that's good answer because uh, we have to always see uh, how patient responds to any of our intervention. So you give pain analgesia, you must make sure that you have a close serial monitoring of the pain score of the patient. Is it getting worse? Is it is the same? Or is it getting less? So if, if you give uh, analgesia and you know there's a positive response to analgesia, pain score will be controlled. And the pain does not come back uh, as, uh, you know, as like a rebound. For that, you need to have a space, a uh, time lap, time interval where you need to observe the patient closely. And I think most of our emergency department, we have a six hour window or four to six hour window of observation ward. Uh, so some emergency department may not have this luxury, but you can still monitor the patient uh, within that four to six hour period, see how the reaction uh, allergic reaction has responded to the uh, uh, antihistamines and, and also the steroid. The dual response that Dr. Hashari said just now may be actually covered with the steroids, but uh, uh, still, uh, if you were to, uh, what I, we, for this case, actually Rex was, uh, was involved. Rex was consulted, as uh, Dr. Hassan said. And we did actually advise them to monitor the patient uh, for at least 24 hours uh, to see uh, various uh, elements of the envenomation and also for the reaction. The other important component that you have to understand if somebody has already this type of reaction is that they are already sensitized. means that patient has already been stung. Uh, he's a fisherman, so most likely he had been stung before. And before uh, this, he did not have any of this uh, reaction. But uh, this time he got it because he has been sensitized. So you need to actually import, important thing to inform the patient is he has to be careful. Now, whenever he goes out fishing, if he encounters such a same fish, please do not get stung again because the subsequent stinging can actually cause a more severe, more uh, acute, uh, severe uh, reaction. It may go straight away into anaphylaxis. Uh, you know, he might not be able to make it to the hospital. So uh, there's another issue where probably the intervention of uh, having an EpiPen, you know, we don't have it in Malaysia. Uh, we discussed this during the wilderness medicine, uh, whether we can have actually EpiPen, we need to prescribe the patient, teach the patient about uh, allergic reactions and how to intervene. And also the most importantly to prevent from getting sensitized again or being uh, stung again in the future. So this is a, things that, you know, people don't talk about uh, or hardly people think about it, you know, and that's why we have this discussion today. So this yeah. is a very good uh, point to bring up also about patient safety. Okay, that's good. Shall we move? So thank you, Prof, for the feedback and also doctors and Profs. So maybe we can proceed with the next uh, case this scenario. So the second case is uh, involved uh, jellyfish. So, um, so uh, this is uh, posted in the, our local news in Malaysia, in which there is a 35 highly venomous box jellyfish were netted oblong Batafaringi after marine scientists thought a special net for 650 meter at about 200 meter from the shoreline on 12th January. So the species identified was uh, Chiropsoides vitendichki, which is a uh, venomous um, jellyfish. So the subsequent case shows there is a Swedish tourist stung to death by jellyfish. So it's occurred in 2018, where a 60 years old Swedish tourist died after allegedly being stung by jellyfish at 3.15 p.m. at Tanjung Ruh, Pulau Langkawi. So this is a very hard uh, breaking uh, news for us. So maybe I would like to, uh, to, to ask the uh, panelists for the discussion. So would the panelists be able to suggest if there is a connection between the first jellyfish and the previous case? Actually, we had another case uh, a few months ago, a French boy 
four years old died of uh, jellyfish sting of uh, a Manjung area, Panko Island. So that is a big, huge uh, news because it involved uh, foreign uh, tourists, uh, similar with this case in Langkawi. But this case in Langkawi was an adult and the child in uh, the, the case in Panko uh, was a four years old French uh, boy. So um, uh, any feedback, uh, Dr. Hassan, maybe? Uh, jellyfish sting, you have jellyfish sting in Brunei? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, Prof. Um, um, uh, actually, for sure, we have uh, some jellyfish uh, swimming by, and for sure, that we have uh, some uh, very adventurous swimmer. Um, so far, I have uh, seen uh, quite a few cases of uh, uh, jellyfish sting, but uh, uh, fortunate enough, uh, it was uh, kind of just a um, mild. Uh, presentation. Uh, none of them have been admitted even uh, overnight to the hospital. I think that's uh, very fortunate. But unfortunately for this uh, gentleman, he lost his, his wife because uh, of the jellyfish. Um, again, um, I'm uh, a bit far from the marine uh, kind of uh, medicine, but again, the uh, uh, kind of conventional wisdom of emergency might kick in. Um, by the end of the day, yeah, the, whatever is things or uh, bites, uh, the final delivery will going to be a venom. And that venom is like uh, technically a cocktail of all nasty things. And uh, uh, the end result, it, it could be some uh, uh, sort of, yeah, for sure, there's going to be pain and need to be addressed urgently. But beside that, uh, all this cocktail of uh, things uh, might uh, affect our channels, especially I'm talking about the channelopathy and all this. And for sure, our heart is like uh, the hub of all these important um, iron gates and channels. And probably the, this kind of venoms might uh, play with those kind of uh, channels. So. Uh, unfortunately, as I have said, um, he uh, kind of arrested, uh, but at the same time, uh, I feel he's uh, fortunate enough that someone there can perform uh, CPR on him. And I think that is uh, a good sign. That means there is some sort of bystander uh, kind of uh, uh, resuscitation. So the, the challenge will be for those kind of cases uh, if they arrive to our ED, for how long we will keep uh, resuscitating them? And the question will be whether or not if we have uh, an antivenom, should we uh, give an antivenom uh, at the time of uh, resuscitation or not? Uh, all this is like kind of uh, very bizarre, complicated uh, questions uh, need to be answered and to be as answered urgently and in a very timely manner. And I'm pretty much sure um, that whether Prof. Kaldun or, or other panelists, they have a good answer for it. Okay, Thank maybe you. Dr. Ushari. Dr. Ushari, would you like to see uh, Kuantan? Kelantan, Kelantan has a good coast, coastal area, <laughs> and there were reports of jellyfish as well uh, in Kelantan, right? Uh, yeah, Prof. Uh, yeah, Prof. Thank you. Uh, but our jellyfish here is very, you know, very nice. <laughs> so basically, uh, yeah, for East Coast, <laughs> East Coast region, I, I guess we um, we never, you know, uh, heard so much about the uh, you know a jellyfish that can uh, like our case. Most of the cases that came to our door basically uh, more to a local reaction, uh, pain, uh, you know, uh, itchiness, rashes. Uh, uh, so far, what I'm you know working here, we don't have any arrested patient uh, due to uh, jelly uh, jellyfish. But since last year, I think uh, around November, January, end of November plus January, where is the monsoon? So we, uh, you know, like Prof. Aldo mentioned, we uh, get a warning from the our um, our what you call the meteorology uh, team as well as the the JPAM here that um, uh, as well. oh yeah oh yeah the 
fisheries department. Yeah, yeah the uh, department that, that, that led us, I think last year, that we uh, received some uh, uh, venomous uh, jellyfish uh, uh, at our shore, especially in area uh, Kota Baru. Uh, they said the, uh, the blue one, I, I can't remember, is it? Blue a bottle. A blue bottle. So the, the, the blue bottle. So uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, give warning to the um, public. So that time we you know, uh, try to avoid uh, our uh, public go to the, uh, the uh, a beach. So, but the, um, uh, one of the uh, important, I think when uh, patient arrested, like Dr. Hassan mentioned, uh, we have to follow the our ACLS um, um, protocol as, as as usual, but the for the anti venom, honestly, I, I don't think we also. I'm not sure. I, I don't think we have the anti venom here for Holden. Uh, uh, and then, uh, but for the uh, uh, how long to resus? I, I guess what we do here, if happen to uh, uh, our ED, so I, I, we just follow the uh, uh, SLS uh, uh, steps. Um, yeah. Otherwise. Uh, here, uh, people talk about the, uh, for mild cases, uh, people talk about the use of um, vinegar. So bring your vinegar to the beach, they said. Okay. <laughs> I think that's my input. Thank you. Okay, you I know Laos and uh, Laos doesn't have a sea, but Vietnam have. Uh, what, what about, have you? Uh, I, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, jellyfish. <laughs> and, um, I agree. Also, the German jellyfish are very nice. <laughs> so they only do a local reaction, maybe so there's no uh, no life threatening uh, symptoms uh, here in, in the North Sea or Baltic Sea. Yeah. Or Ripaban. <laughs> or Ripaban. <laughs> okay, so uh, so yes, uh, which is very important uh, for us as as per snake bite. Uh, you see, just now, can you move to the first picture? So this jellyfish is uh, reported in the news. So what we get uh, in the news is sometimes uh, distorted uh, information. Uh, so if you look at the species that they mention, it's uh, Carapsoides butindiki. Uh, yes, it is the box jellyfish. This is one of the family, uh, one of the species in the box jellyfish or cubozoan. And uh, but uh, strangely enough, the the stings from this box jellyfish is not uh, that harmful to human. Okay, and maybe if you are a fish, yeah, but, but apparently it's not too human. Uh, therefore, uh, they say, if you noted the, the, the statement uh, in the news, uh, it says uh, very venomous uh, jellyfish, but that doesn't imply that it is actually causing harm to human. The difference is the one that you saw, the case uh, in Langkawi. Uh, the case in Langkawi, if you noted the picture, if you can zoom into the picture, there are many uh, uh sort of like you know marks and marking on the chest so that's where he was stung he was stung on the chest and those markings uh, that you see in that news is typical for the uh, chironex species you can see uh, on the stomach and also uh, on the chest wall so there are multiple tentacle marking there so those are very typical of what we call the uh, multi-tentacle box jellyfish which is known to be the, one of the most deadly uh, jellyfish in the world. So we have several species of this species uh, of this box jellyfish, but in Malaysia, we still do not really have confirmation about the, the, the species of this box jellyfish. So we are still liaising with our uh, biologists, marine biologists uh, to go sampling and actually identifying, get the taxonomy uh, and also uh, uh, the distribution of this box jellyfish. Uh, you are right, uh, Dr. Hushairi said, yes, we did get a um, warning from certain uh, departments uh, about jellyfish uh, landing on the beach, but this may not be related to box jellyfish. In Kelantan, we have not really identified, we have not encountered any cases that along the coast of East Coast, all the way to uh, Terengganu and also Pahang uh, to have uh, this type of box jellyfish. But some patients, uh, some some uh, divers, people go diving, right? So they, they have good connection with uh, what we call uh, a divers uh, group. I can't remember the name, but they do report uh, if they encounter jellyfish. Uh, so some of them did find box jellyfish in around the island of 
I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Tioman Island. Okay. The other area that has been reporting uh, death from jellyfish uh, sting most likely is from the Caronex species, which is the multi tentacle box jellyfish, is in Sabah. So we have heard a few death cases in Sabah, well documented, uh, involving tourists as well. One of the earliest ones that actually stirred the issue about uh, acquiring anti venom for box jellyfish is uh, a case of a Japanese boy, three years old, uh, died after uh, stung in Tanjung Aru, okay, uh, that's in Sabah, Kota Kinabalu. So he, he, he from that case, uh, Malaysia, we were called to uh, consult it. Again, Rex was involved uh, and uh, to see whether we, we need or not anti-venom for jelly, box jellyfish in Malaysia. So again, uh, we, we look at Australia, uh, their experience actually, and also we look at other studies uh, about the anti-venom uh, to see whether it match or not with the venom from the Chironex species that we find in Sabah. Uh, and we said, yes, we can use it. And we have used it before uh, for cases. So the question uh, just now, Dr. Uh, Hassan say, if during resuscitation, do we give antivenom for box jellyfish? Uh, yes, that is actually the one that we give. Uh, so if somebody is resuscitated, there are three classes or three level when we want to give antivenom for box jellyfish. If in, in that stage of uh, continuous resuscitation, uh, chest compression, we give uh, the full uh, three dose, three valves, okay? So if let's say patient still uh, not uh, still conscious and just suffering acute pain, not so much of other, other symptoms, we can start with one vial, okay? Uh, if having some cardiac symptom but still not collapse, we can give two vials. But if a patient like this already collapsed and CPR is ongoing, we can straight away give the full uh, three valves. Okay, so uh, it's not as expensive as the sea snake and the venom, but uh, in Malaysia at the moment, in I can say uh, in ASEAN at the moment, uh, the only country that has acquired box jellyfish and the venom from Caronex, uh, uh, Caronex uh, species is uh, only in Sabah. Uh, there we have several hospitals around Sabah having this anti venom. What about this case in Langkawi, you ask? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the antivenom in Langkawi uh, at the moment. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the case, recent case in, uh, in, in, in Manjong uh, bring up again the discussion whether we should have some stock of antivenom, box jellyfish antivenom uh, somewhere along the coastal hospital, uh, whether in Manjong uh, or whether in Langkawi as well. Okay, so we, we're still not sure whether that will, will happen or not because it involves uh, further discussion about the uh, pro and cons of having this uh, box jellyfish and venom. Okay, uh, Penang is also another hot spot as you see just now in the picture. Uh, we had other cases, other species there which can cause more harm. Uh, we are seeing uh, a lot of what we call involving vasoconstriction of peripheral limbs, you know, uh, and that can lead to uh, hypoxia and death to the tissues and also loss of the limb. So some gangrene issues, okay? So we'll discuss about this case uh, during the upcoming uh, AMAS uh, conference in, in KL uh, in uh, August, okay? All right, so I think that's, that's a good uh, discussion as well. Anybody else would like to add on any question? Uh, Prof, we actually have a question from the chat box. Uh, so a student has asked, uh, she said, good afternoon to all doctors. Uh, in cases of seeing these cases firsthand at the scene, uh, to which team should we refer the patient to? What are some immediate management that can be done to reduce the toxin effect in cases of absence of antivenom in our facility? And if we do require patient transfer to other facility, what are the optimum or golden time that we should adhere to prevent a more severe complication? Any of the panelists would like to go first? Uh, uh, can I come in? Uh, 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 from my side, uh, I think uh, if this is a question from the public, uh, the answer will be very short. Scoop and run. <laughs> what we mean by that? <laughs> um, don't waste much of time. Yes, uh, he or she might be in bed. Uh, not much can be done on the scene. The soon as possible, 
send him to the nearest, a nearby hospital. I think that would be the great I think that we can do for him or her. Thank you. Uh, Shadi, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I uh, quite agree with uh, Dr. Hassan. So if you have the uh, seen this arrested patient, uh, what you do as follow the sequence, uh, do the CPR if, if you know, and next we call for help. You know, uh, you need to uh, bring patient as soon as possible to the uh, uh, hospital. Just follow the yeah, basic life support. Yeah, okay. That's very good. So uh, as mentioned just now, Dr. Ashri mentioned about vinegar. So that's the first aid that you can do. You can actually douse the patient uh, area of stung with vinegar. The, the whole idea of vinegar is not to neutralize venom that has already entered your body. Yeah, the whole idea of vinegar is to prevent other stinging cells which has not been activated from activating when you are touching it and causing harm to you and also for the victim. So that's the whole role of vinegar. It's not to neutralize the vinegar, uh, to neutralize the venom uh, from the sting, okay? So it's just to prevent further harm from happening. Uh, so if the patient already developed uh, cardiorespiratory arrest like this patient, of course, uh, the most important to do is actually to start CPR, basic life support, get help, call for help, and get ambulance and transfer to hospital. Most likely, uh, our paramedic will start to put in uh, LMA and do airway resuscitation and prevention uh, and also continue CPR with uh, the machine, okay, uh, until they reach the emergency department. And again, we continue, and if we have the antivenom, we'll give antivenom while the uh, resuscitation is ongoing. Uh, and hoping that the cardiac will um, uh, respond. The good thing about jellyfish and venom is that they are rather transient. Uh, they don't last long. I mean, in terms of the uh, effect uh, or, or, or uh, on, on the cardiac uh, thing. Cardiac, they can immediately affect, but it doesn't, it is a transient envenomation. So once the venom is removed, hopefully the cardiac will actually able to come back uh, and beat on its own, okay? Uh, yeah, so we normally, uh, for this case, uh, we, we know about this case, uh, the resuscitation by the bystander took 40, uh, about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, I think, uh, before the ambulance arrived. So, <laughs> you know, uh, and then they continue uh, the CPR on the scene, uh, but again, the patient could not make it and he died. Okay, so they did not even bring, manage to bring the patient to the emergency department. Patient died on the scene, uh, but uh, after ear unable to respond, uh, no ROIC respond, uh, was able to, uh, to achieve uh, after the prolonged CPR. Okay. All right, so that's, that's honing in why C, uh, basic life support is important for the public, one, uh, of course, and then... Uh, doing the right thing. Some people put uh, all kinds of things on this patient. As Dr. Hashari said, you know, somebody may pee on the patient, you know, may uh, put sand on the patient. So those things actually uh, can actually cause more harm. It doesn't do anything, okay? So the only first aid uh, that we recommend is just apply vinegar just to prevent from others getting hurt uh, and then uh, bring to the hospital as soon as possible as what Dr. Hassan has already said, okay? So, right. Thank you. Maybe we have any other question or next case? Um, I think we'll move on to the next case then, Prof. Yeah, okay. Just now the question, do we have, uh, uh, if we don't have antivenom, what should we do? I think that's, that's the answer I said. Uh, we just continue CPR, uh, supportive care, hoping that the patient will uh, revive uh, if we don't have the antivenom, okay? <laughs> All right, so moving on to the next case. Okay. Right, so this is a case regarding a 34-year-old woman, a case of tetrodoxin poisoning with neurotoxicity signs, allegedly post-consumption of shishamo fish. Okay. So this happened uh, in Cebu, Sarawak. So earlier uh, this year, so at 12 p.m., the patient actually had lunch, which was prepared by her mother. 
uh, consisting of a home fried shishamo fish. The size of the fish is about 7 milliliter, uh, millimeters. And it was bought from the supermarket. And the fish internal organs were actually given by the local fishermen for free. There was also fish roll. So within 15 minutes of post-consumption, the patient actually complained of oral as well as tongue numbness upper limb as well as lower limb numbness and weakness associated with multiple episodes of nausea and vomiting. So at about 1.30, which was one and a half hours after, uh, the patient arrived at, private medical, at a private medical center and she was treated as food poisoning and given IV Maxalon. So at 11.45 p.m., the patient was brought to ETD Stable Hospital. Uh, her GCS at this time was E2V5M6, so 13 or 15, and initially her power was four limbs, her vital signs were stable at this time. These are the pictures of the uh, shishamo fish itself as well as the internal organ. From the, um, this was the balance of the internal organ that the patient could uh, retrieve. The rest were consumed. Okay, so at ETD Cebu, the patient was then seen uh, by the medical team. So at the time when she was seen by the medical team, her GCS at the time was already E2V3 M4 with slurred speech near complete ptosis bilaterally. The power of her limbs proximally was 0.5 and distally 1.5. So her neck power was 0.5 and uh, her reflexes were absent. Her pupils were non-reactive to light as well as sluggish. So all her other symptoms were unremarkable. The patient was electively intubated for airway protection. Supportive treatment was continued and the remaining fish eaten was taken to be tested. So the remaining fish was, which was not eaten were raw and still uncooked. Uh, the patient's grandfather was also admitted due to perioral extremity numbness, two hours post fish consumption and no weakness. Power was 5-5 five, five, and there was no tosis. Reflexes were present. Her pupils were 3 out of 3. So patient was then extubated two days later. Progress was noted that her conditioning was, was improving with only mild dizziness. And six days post her presentation, uh, the patient was ambulating and all her blood investigations were normal. Patient was then discharged. Right, so we can see this is the analysis report uh, done by the hospital, so for, especially from the Department of Fisheries Malaysia. So we can see that it was positive for tetrodotoxin um, and the samples given were the two samples, which was the uh, shishamu fish itself as well as the internal organ. Okay, so I would like to invite our panelists for a discussion. Again, this case uh, is closer to Dr. Hassan. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dr. Hassan, you will go first. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, okay. Um, for this uh, puffer fish and uh, this uh, tetra detoxin, um, the, the issue with uh, this, uh, it fish is not, is... we don't know it's puffer fish or not. It's a shishamo fish, if you notice. And we have uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, this. Uh, uh, kind of fish, uh, uh, as uh, if I remember well, is like kind of uh, some sort of uh, uh, tetradotoxin uh, containing uh, fish. And I do remember that a uh, few years ago, we have encountered, uh, this is back home, uh, a gentleman came in barely breathing and barely uh, moving after he ate some uh fish meal uh, anyway at that point of time uh, nothing clear but uh finally uh he was get intubated and then just uh some sort of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, supportive care and he managed to be uh, walking home after a few days if i remember well i think around six to five days so back to uh, this kind of uh uh, intoxication. So um, what I assume is this is uh, it could be uh, some sort of uh, uh, fish organ containing uh, this uh, tetra tetoxin. And the wrong concept uh, uh, among the public is that if there is a toxin or venom can always be uh, naturalized or denaturalized by cooking. And that is, might not be correct or definitely not correct when it comes to this uh, tetra detox. Whatever you cook, 
he will be there. And if you are not lucky enough, you get it, definitely you feel it. Uh, but at the same time, also, this kind of uh, um, intoxication usually has some kind of a crescendo uh, uh, of progress. Uh, what I mean by that, it will not start abruptly. So at least that will give us a time, give us a time to think for the patient to come to the hospital and for us as the doctor to think about the, what we can do the best. So uh, definitely for this kind of case, uh, kind of cases, um, optimal supportive care is the key here. And when I say optimal supportive care, the key is, again, we go A, B, C, D. And uh, clearly from the vitals and all these, this gentleman, uh, shortly he might not be able to be breathed by his own. And definitely that um, airway uh, need to be secured. Uh, C circulation need to be looked at at any point of time. Uh, he might go to hypotensive or shock that it could be part of information, but at the same time also, it could be just part of the um, anaphylactic kind of shock or reaction. So my main message here is, when you face with this kind of presentation, optimal supportive care is the key. You follow your very classical A, B, C, D, E support. At the same time, you have to look around and try to figure out what might be the cause. Because if you get what might be the cause, definitely you might look around and you will see how you can denaturalize it, whether by maybe available uh, antitoxin, or if you don't have it, at least you know what you are dealing with, and accordingly you can tailor your management plan. I do remember that gentleman, um, we don't have any kind of um, antidote or so. Simply he was just intubated, um, uh, kind of supportive care uh, was there. And progressively uh, he emerged from the intubation and he managed to be extubated and he walked home. So if I have to say one message here, supportive care is the key. Go classical, A, B, C, D, E, and look around. If you are uh, fortunate enough and your patient fortunate enough, you will be able to determine with what might be the reason behind uh, this presentation. And then everything will be much easier after that. So I think that's my take on this. Um, I just want to add one more thing. Here in Bruna, yes, we have a lot of, um, so many kinds of fishes. But the good things about here is a lot of our uh, locals, they know well what they are dealing with. Yeah, sometimes they might uh, have here and there some sort of adventurous kind of uh, uh, exposure. But uh, up to now, I've been here for a decent uh, number of years. Uh, we haven't uh, come across uh, those kind of uh, uh, intoxication, uh, fortunately, and hopefully not. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Shari, any such poisoning in East Coast? <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, I, I don't have uh, much exposure on the uh, this uh, TTX uh, uh, poisoning, but I just want to highlighted here, uh, if you see the first slide, uh, it's remind me and also our future doctors. You know, uh, we are very fortunate to have our class today about the uh, uh, toxinology. You see, uh, when young patient uh, came with this uh, symptom and sign, you see the tongue numbness, upper limb numbness, and weakness, is that with multiple episodes of nausea and vomiting, you see, and patient went to the private medical center, and was treated as food poisoning, <laughs> you know. So if if uh, if we don't have any exposure of toxinology and we don't uh, get the proper history from patient, you, we we might miss this patient. 
you know, all patient with kind of nausea vomiting with SAGE, food poisoning, gimetzolone, and sandbag. But this patient actually, you know, young patient with numbness and weakness. So uh, with this, I, I hope with this uh, exposure to us, uh, the tox toxicology is one of your differential diagnosis and try to get the, you know, uh, uh, proper history. Uh, so I guess other management in terms of uh, uh, TTX, I think that uh, Hassan Ali explained about the mainly this uh, supportive care. But the, the important message I want to highlight here, don't simply jump to conclusion, any patient knows their vomiting is uh, AGE are proven otherwise. No, you must take the further history uh, to get the, uh, to reach the uh, proper diagnosis. Thank you, Dr. Rohan Yeti. Do you? Laos don't eat uh, puffer fish? Not much. So I have to say, I also I haven't been exposed to these kind of cases. So my knowledge is only from books and articles. But uh, what I know about tetrodotoxin, it, it's uh, it's quite a typical case. And then you 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 found the tetrodotoxin in in the in the uh, uh, in the fish and in the internal organs. So the good thing about it, but I agree with Dr. Hassan, important is here uh, a good uh, symptomatic treatment, uh, uh, care of the patient. Uh, but the good thing is that usually after uh, 24, 48, uh, maximum 72 hours, uh, the, the, in the, the environment is done. So there is not a, a chronic uh, 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 action of this toxin, uh, as far as I know, so the patient will be fine after proper uh, symptomatic treatment. But of course, that is very important because he can die quickly from respiratory failure. Yeah, yeah okay. So uh, the, the take home from this case is that the sashimo fish is actually edible fish. It's not poisonous. Okay, It doesn't contain the tetrodotoxin. What actually caused the poisoning is from the uh, internal organ that is given to them by the fishermen. All right, so they cooked it together and they ate it, and that contaminate the sashimo fish. Uh, as you can see in the um, uh, the specimen, unfortunately, was only obtained after they arrived to Cebu Hospital. We asked for the for the uh, what are the fishes that they ate. Uh, this was not evident in the um, a private medical center. So uh, this specimen was then collected. So this is all about academic now because we treat the patient first. We don't wait until we know what it is before we treat the patient. So from the symptom, uh, syndromic approach, we already know this is most likely a tetrodotoxin poisoning. Uh, Rex was consulted, of course, and uh, we already advised the uh, management as rightly put it was a supportive care, airway, breathing, circulation is actually uh, the, the way to go. Once you protect that, it's just giving time. So tetrodotoxin from puffer fish is not new. Uh, just a few weeks or a few uh, a month, a month ago, we had a death in Malaysia in, from Johor, uh, a case of eating also unidentified fish bought at the market. So this fish has been removed, the head, everything already clean, but... Uh, when they uh, brought home and ate, and they got the sign, typical again, sign and symptom of uh, tetrodotoxin poisoning. And that fish that they ate was actually a puffer fish. So the wife uh, died uh, on the same day, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when they arrived to hospital, and the husband died, I think, a few weeks later. Okay, so these are still on, uh, you, you, we still record death from tetrodotoxin poisoning from eating puffer fish in Malaysia. For example, if this, the, this patient die, uh, the one that should be blamed is the one that gave them the, uh, the, the, the fisherman that gave them the internal organ of that fish. So that could lead to a possible, possible manslaughter, uh, you know, causing death uh, from giving them a poison. So uh, these are still very much, uh, I think uh, not much awareness in the public. It's different from in Japan. You know, Japan has the culture of eating fugu and uh, they only uh, allow certain licensed uh, operator to actually uh, process and serve the fugu. If I have a good friend of mine, Prof. Uh, uh, Yoshito Kamijo, uh, he goes fishing. He goes fishing in the sea 
he gets fugu fish, he gets the puffer fish, but he himself does not uh, clean and cook the fish. He brought the fish to the licensed chef and the chef cleaned the fish, cooked the fish for him. So up to that stage of awareness in Japan. So in Malaysia, as we can see, we are still far behind. Okay, so this is where uh, cases like this is being highlighted. All right. So we have to do something both in the public uh, domain in terms of awareness and of course from our side as a clinical toxinologist uh, to also include how to best manage. In this case, it's very good. We managed to get the specimen, we send to the lab, we get the clinical, uh, we get the toxicology, analytical toxicology being done. We get the level of uh, uh, tetrodotoxin contained in each of the specimen and we confirm our diagnosis. Okay, so a lot of things uh, need to be done uh, in order to improve the uh, so-called management for patients. Lah. Okay, uh, so awareness is key, I think, for this case. All right, thank you. Any more cases, any questions for this case? Yeah, I, I have a question uh, uh, according to the, you, do you think the internal organs uh, were not from, uh, from the fish, but from a puffer fish? Yes. So if you see, can you put up the result? Can you see the result? They analyzed both uh, the, the shishamo fish and also the internal organ. Uh, so you can see the internal organ uh, contain the tetrodotoxin at 213,925.96. So ah, okay. the, the, reference, the reference of tetrodotoxin is, is 2,000 only. And uh, the shishamo fish is only 300, uh, 375. So it's not the sheshamo fish, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's actually the internal organ. And uh, mm -hmm. that is like, you know, yeah. okay. and we know for puffer fish, the internal organs are the, contains the highest concentration of tetrodotoxin. So mm -hmm. this is another, another issue that can come up is people uh, can do crime, criminal by poisoning. You can just give uh, someone, you know, cook someone. They don't like you. I don't like Dr. Hassan. I give him, uh, <laughs> treat him, treat him for seafood, and I, you know, put uh, the internal organ in his meal. That's it, right? Uh, so this is another area that is that, that we need to be aware of. You know, all this fall play that can happen. All right, all right. Okay. So next, maybe. Awesome. Uh, Prof, I do have a question. If let's just say like for our role as a medical officer, of course, we have to treat the patient first, but is there a duration of time that we have to be mindful of in terms to notify uh, of this occurrence? Just for uh, the safety so, of other people uh, buying the fish, yeah. Yeah, so that's what happened in Johor. When mm -hmm. that case happened, we were actually consulted, Rex was consulted as well. And the most important about for any poisoning is to make a report for the public health. So every uh, district or have daerah has a public health. Uh, you have to report to them and uh, action need to be taken in terms of sampling uh, or if let's say uh, area is dangerous, they will cordon the area uh, and the sampling need to be tested. Of course, it will alert. And I think in that case in, in, in Johor, uh, it, caught the, in, it caught the interest of the politicians so of course uh, they, they make noise uh, and uh, that's good and bad. Uh, when they make noise, uh, we hope that the, you know, everybody gets uh, the information and the right information. But uh, the bad thing is that it's like hot, hot chicken shit. <laughs> you know, it doesn't last long. And once the issue is done, it died off. No real action being taken. So that's where we come in, uh, in terms of how to educate uh, proper, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, instructions uh, or protocol needs to be uh, adhered to in terms of which fish not to, to sell and so on and so forth. So uh, we still have a lot of work uh, ahead of us uh, in terms of this kind of uh, protocol and legislation, you know, uh, to make our public safe. Because the public put their life at the, at the hands of the one who sell the fish. But if the one who sells the fish doesn't really, you know, take care about it, uh, they are the ones supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, penalized for this type of issues. Okay. And for your information, Malaysia in Sarawak, there's a festival for Fugu Festival uh, every year in Buntal, uh, near, not that far from Kuching. So, yeah, they said so far nobody died. Well, we don't know that. They may not know. 
somebody slept after a meal and did not wake up. And they think that this natural cause rather than actual poisoning from the food, food fish. <laughs> yeah, okay. So thank you, Prof and Doctor, for the feedback. So maybe we can proceed with the last uh, case. So this is uh, regarding a 34 years old Lance Corporal who alleged Cobra bite. So for this case, I would like to invite Dr. Fidaus, a first year Master of Emergency Medicine student at University Science Malaysia to give a thought of the case. So Dr. the floor is yours. Everyone? All right, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, professors, doctors, and our future doctors. Uh, my name is Mohamed Fedaus, one of the uh, emergency medical officers at the Hospital University of Science uh, Malaysia. Uh, today, I would like to share a recent encounter on the fatal case of uh, Naja Kotiabai. Uh, what happened was we had a gentleman, a 33-year-old snake handler with our with a local agency, was brought to us on the 7th of May at 9 in the morning for an alleged freshly caught Naja Kotia bite over the palma aspect of the uh, right uh, right thumb. So basically, he, uh, what happened was uh, in the morning of the uh, of the incident. Uh, he was cleaning the enclosure contained the freshly caught uh, Najakotia snakes. There were a total of three snakes inside the enclosure and patient did not wear any gloves or any PPE when he was bitten. Past medical history wise, this gentleman had a prior history of Najakotia bite over the right hand as well back in 2017, of which uh, fasciotomy and the amputation of the right middle finger were done. Post-incident, he complained of severe pain with paresthesia over the right hand. Upon arrival to our side at 9 in the morning, patient otherwise conscious, well perfused, and he was in pain. Otherwise, no, no focal signs of neurological deficit. He monetary was stable with initial pain score of 5 over 10. Physical examination were unremarkable apart from the right hand, of which the right hand was swollen as standing proximally to the wrist joint, and there was the evidence of black discoloration over the dorsal aspect of the right thumb. However, the CRT of all fingers was still less than two seconds, and fang mark was clearly seen over the palmar aspect of the right thumb. And at 9.30 a.m., exactly one hour post-incident, the, the rate of proximal progression was already eight centimeters per hour. <coughs> Next slide, please. So these are the initial pictures taken upon his arrival. The first photo showed the fang mark over the base of the right thumb. And you can see clearly the early demonocratic changes can be seen over the dorsal aspect of the right uh, thumb. Next, please. So Rex team were immediately consulted at 9.40 in the morning. So the consultant involved agreed with the diagnosis of Naja Kotia by with local inflammation with early democratic skin changes. And five vials of Naja Kotia intervenum was, was initiated. And he advised that given the presence of the, mon the monocrosis, we were to anticipate the potential extension of the, uh, of the necrosis. So five vials of NKAV was started at 10 in the morning and completed at 11 in the morning and medical team was referred. Initial blood investigations were unremarkable with creatinine kinase elevated at 185. Next. Next slide, Next slide please. Sorry, doctor, there's a bit of a delay. This, despite the completion of the first dose of NKAV, patient was still in persistent pain. Earlier, we gave him tramadol 100 mg with fentanyl. So he was started on infusion morphine of 2 mg per hour when fentanyl 50 might uh, given on PRN basis as well. IV unicin was started 
uh, with dose of 1.5 gram stat and TDS, and progression of local swelling and dermal necrosis were observed. Otherwise, there was no evidence of uh, systemic envenomation. Despite the completion of the first dose of NKAV, the pain was still persistent at 10 over 10. So Rex team was consulted again, and another five vials of NKAV was started at 1 p.m. and completed at 2 p.m. So at the time, orthopedic team was referred as well, of which the input from the team is that patient is not for any surgical intervention yet, and for our team to continue the antibiotic and for right upper limb elevation and for auto team to review the patient every three hourly. Next, please. After the completion of the uh, second dose of antivenom, the RPP started to diminish and remained at zero centimeter per hour. However, given the persistent pain, he was referred to the acute pain service team. And patient was started on PCA fentanyl and he was started on infusion ketamine of 6 mg per hour with addition of IV denistat 40 mg BD as well. And subsequently, patient was admitted to the medical ward at 7 p.m. on the same day as well. Next, please. These are basically the vital signs showing the, uh, the, the, the vitals of the patient in the afternoon and leading towards the admission to the medical ward. <clears throat> Next, please. On the ward, during the morning review on the 8th of May, at 8 in the morning, exactly 24 hours post-incident, documented that the demo, the demo necrosis was uh, worsening with serious discharge was observed. The entire the right hand and the right forearm was swollen with firm compartment and delayed uh, CRT over all fingers. And according to the patient, the pain and the paresthesia was mostly concentrated over the thumb. Despite the persistent pain, the RPP remains zero and the documented saturation of the right thumb was only 88%. And however, patient did not manifest any features of systemic envenomation at that point of time. And patient had a low grade temperature of 37.4 on the morning review. Next, please. So the, med the medical team consulted Rex at 11 in the morning. The third dose of NKAV completed at 2 p.m. on the 8th of May. Uh, the creatinine kinase raised from 185 to 3,600 and further raised to 5,850. The RPP remained static at zero but the pain and paresthesia was still the same with the pain score between five to six over 10. So from the APS team, infusion ketamine was increased from six milligram per hour to eight mg per hour and patient was continued with PCA fentanyl and IV denistat and PCM one gram QID as well. Next, please. On the ward, at 10.45 p.m., roughly about 36 hours post-incident, patient desaturated with saturation of only 82% under room air with worsening tachypnea with documented temperature of 37.5. At a point of time, uh, it was documented that the lung findings on oscillation was fairly clear. However, the right forearm and the hand compartments were firm with worsening uh, dermonecrosis. The discoloration, the discoloration uh, worsened. The discoloration further worsened, and the SpO2 was undetectable over the right thumb, of which the SpO2 only, only was only eighty six percent over the index finger, and the, the remaining fingers were were fine. ABG was taken showed metabolic acidosis with type one type one respiratory failure of which the PO2 was only 71 and the high flow mass 15, uh, 15 liter per minute. So antibiotics at the point of time was escalated to IV tazosin, 4.5 gram stat was given. 
Next, please. Rats team was consulted again at 12 midnight. So patient was given the fourth dose of uh, NKAV, of which the five valves of NKAV was completed at one in the morning. NS team was referred for ICU admission and patient was subsequently started on HFNC 60 liter per minute with FI 2.0.5. Given the worsening renal profile and hyperkalemia of potassium 5.7, he was given lytic cocktail and patient was subsequently intubated at 2.30 in the morning for respiratory distress. Given the worsening metabolic acidosis, nephrologist was consulted and patient was planned for urinary alkalinization and later for CVV HDF as well. Next. However, at 8 a.m. in the morning, prior to admission to the ICU, patient further desaturated with SpO2 was only 76% on manual bagging. BP uh, worsened, requiring up titration of inotropic support, and patient developed asystole at 9.20 in the morning. CPR was performed a total of 40 minutes and further lactic cocktails were given. However, ROAC was unable to be attained. Hence, CPR was stopped at 10 in the morning. So Rex was consulted and the cause of death given was snake bite and venoming complicated by tissue necrosis and severe sepsis as well. The initial blood cultures came back with aeromonas hydrophilia, of which they are sensitive to keftazidim, cipro, kefrasim, and uh, tazosin as well. This is basically the chest X-ray post-intubation showing the diffuse haziness and opacification of bilateral lungs. I think that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pedos. Uh... Maybe we have a short comment from Prof. Hushairi. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Aljun and Dr. Fridaus. Uh, actually, uh, we decided to share this uh, case. Uh, um, uh, definitely, it's a sad story uh, uh, for us. Um, but the um, uh, important, few important points, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, we learn from this case. Um, uh, even though um, how good we are, uh, and not really good actually, how good, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, we see cases uh, of uh, snake bite before, but the uh, this kind of cases, uh, you know, uh, is unique. Uh, uh, we handle, it, we hand, uh, you know, uh, this uh, patient basically a snake uh, handler, a very experienced person, uh, have uh, multiple, you know, bites before, uh, and it, we can see from uh, his hand had history of uh, you know a uh, uh, facial tommy before uh, with huge scar, so um, you know it's quite challenging to us to uh, you know when we uh, managing this case. Initially, we thought when we start on anti venom, most of the cases you know uh, it's not complicated like this, so they will slowly resolve. But this patient is uh, very unique because of uh, you know. The uh, for uh, refractory pain. I, I I saw him when when he came in our ED. Uh, at, at that point, he he still can talk to us, you know. Uh, but uh, the pain is uh, very, very how to say is excruciating thing pain, no very painful. So uh, that's why we we uh, get the opinion from uh, EPS. We look more on anti venom, uh, but uh, you know uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, when you know patient uh, admitted, uh, you know we uh, we refer to other discipline and then they have done their best. Uh, I guess, Prof. Aldun, um, from our side, uh, maybe we need to hear from uh, expert also what we can improve. Uh, you know, input from Dr. George and also Dr. Hassan and and team. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, yeah, or Dr. Hassan, what what do you oh, yeah. want to uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, very unfortunate, and uh, clearly uh, your team has done whatever is supposed to be done, uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, you lost him. 
Um, but for sure, there is a few points uh, probably uh, we can highlight. Um, this gentleman, he's a snake handler. So being a snake handler by profession, and he get bitten by the same snake that he's looking uh, after, uh, probably he has two disadvantages. Uh, first of all, probably he has, uh, and for sure he has an exposure to these kind of venoms. So the next one is going to be more or more uh, kind of augmented uh, uh, action on him, unfortunately. This is from the venom uh, point of view. And the other side of it is uh, from the uh, anaphylaxis point of view. He, he considered to be already pre-sensitized. So probably the last bite was uh, the one uh, who flared up all these kind of uh, pre-exposure uh, issues. So um, I just want to highlight the, the issue of uh, persistent pain. Uh, yes, um, uh, all array of uh, analgesia was uh, tried. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, any suggestion or any uh, discussion was about the probably uh, regional block. Uh, because if we have done some regional block, uh, probably he might be saved uh, from being exposed to all this uh, infusion of ketamine, fentanyl, and all these. Uh, this is one. The second one is um, he has shown uh, definitely uh, sign and symptoms of uh, envenomation. But uh, probably there is uh, an undergoing some sort of like anaphylaxis to anaphylactic shock. So having said that, um, I'm not sure whether or not uh, giving adrenaline might help in this uh, case. Uh, this is my second point. My third point is, uh, uh, again, this gentleman, he started to desaturate, and uh, it seems to be they, there was a trail of uh, HF and C. Uh, I'm not pretty much sure whether that FM, uh, HF and C will help much compared to um, intubation and ventilation. So these are the three points that um, uh, I want to highlight it. Um, probably um, regional block, it might help. This is one. Number two, uh, early intubation, uh, proper intubation and ventilation rather than HF and C. Uh, also, I think it might uh, help. Uh, the third one is, um, if we have thought of this, is it could be some sort of an ongoing or insidiously kicks in some sort of uh, anaphylactic shock, which might not be necessarily reflected in, on his BP. And if you consider that and we gave adrenaline, may or might not help. So um, that is the thing that I want to highlight. But from the uh, management point of view, I do believe that uh, whatever needs to be done has been uh, uh, done for him, but unfortunately, uh, uh, you lost him. Uh, thank you. Yo, uh, any input from your side? Uh, yes. Uh, I actually, I, I rarely see uh, such a case uh, uh, with a rapid uh, progression of, uh, of uh, local science. And I think this case is uh, uh, the, the local science really rapidly uh, progressed first. And also the pain uh, was very severe. That was also a sign that there was a, a severe cytotoxic action ongoing uh, on, the, on the bite side. So no neurotoxic signs, obviously, but uh, severe local signs and, and, and rapid progression of the local signs. And uh, I guess uh, uh, he died finally of septic uh, shock, sepsis. Uh, so you could even for, for the in the first blood culture, there was already the aromas, uh, eutrophilia. And uh, I, I don't know whether in, the, in these cases where this rapid uh, progression is, whether there is surgical intervention uh, maybe indicated early and also maybe a more aggressive uh, coverage with antibiotics from the very beginning uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, cover uh, uh, most uh, gram-negative bacteria. 
Well, that is my my idea. I, I don't know, uh, Dr. Kaldum, uh, do you remember the case of, of uh, king cobra bites in Vietnam? I thought it was also aromas uh, yeah. Yeah. culture there. Yeah. Ne? yeah, so yeah. I don't know whether this is a, is a, a, a special b a gram negative bacteria causing yeah. this uh, severe symptoms. Also, this uh, patient uh, went into uh, a septic shock uh, when I yeah. remember. Yes, uh, there was a bit more, uh, more severe uh, with, with patchy necrosis as well in the one, the case in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, this is not really so-called our first encounter with um, uh, with a rapid progression of, uh, I would say, uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Okay, mm -hmm. so there, there are two components here that 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 we already alerted uh, the team uh, early on during the consult, which is this patient has already uh, uh, compromised uh, tissue uh, in that area in the bite area. He had fasciitomy before, a big scar. So there's a, a, a area where the blood supply in the area is actually already compromised and, uh, and also um, you know uh, weakness in the in terms of resistance so um, the bite on the thumb which is not on the the tina side which is on the dorsal side of the thumb uh, already shows the spread uh, is quite rapid uh, that could be from the initial envenomation itself from tissue cytotoxic destruction but what happens next is actually the, 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 the venom finds and whatever it contains uh, finds its way to the, uh, if, you, if you look at the, 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 the hand, the necrosis actually follow the, along the um, uh, scar tissue. So this is also what we had experienced in the past in Pahang when we had a case of king cobra bite, also wild caught uh, by a fire and rescue officer. Uh, he also had the same scar before from Francitomy, previous scar, and he got bitten and the same pattern appears. Uh, that one was a bit more severe uh, because it was a king cobra. Uh, so we managed with a lot of antivenom, similar with this case. So we don't feel that the, 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 the tissue destruction and so on is purely uh, because of the venom, because the antivenom was given quite a lot. And that probably neutralized the, the, the neurotoxin. But what, 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 what's going on on the side is also, I think the antivenom that we gave could not reach the area where uh, the spread of the infection occurred. And uh, this is a very, very uh, aggressive uh, sort of like uh, bacteria uh, that, uh, you know, leads to most like most most or most likely is due to the necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, how to intervene? As we saw, it's not common uh, to have necrotizing fasciitis in a snake bite. But when it happens like this, uh, early surgical intervention may actually be warranted. Either he probably lose uh, the limb or uh, you know um, or his life. You know. So uh, this is actually where the clinical experience come into play. Uh, what we have to do is most likely um, collaborate with uh, making an earlier decision. Uh, and, 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 and all the signs and symptoms uh, shows towards uh, severe sepsis. Uh, you have, I think your platelet count, betul lah, Fridaus, the platelet count is dropped uh, also quite, quite bad. Uh, I think so. These are a few signs which conforms to uh, severe sepsis. Mm. Uh, so um, yeah, it's quite unfortunate. Uh, we've you've stepped up the uh, we, we 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 stepped up the antibiotics. Initially, we didn't give, but we already alerted and we 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 started the antibiotics. But still, uh, you know, it couldn't. It's so rapid. The case uh, here is uh, within. 48 hours, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that he demised. The case that we had previously in Kuantan was uh, uh, for four days. Uh, he, he also passed away because of complication, not directly from the venom, but from the uh, secondary infection that he uh, he gets. So you have to bear in mind uh, that you know certain things like this. I'm not sure, I'm, I, I shouldn't say it's meant to be, but uh, if we see a patient that has a compromised tissue, uh, we have to maybe a bit more 
cautious uh, and be more aggressive in our approach uh, to such patient because we, you know we can anticipate something like this so the pain local pain and so on uh, without further necrotizing shows local destruction uh, from the uh, offending bacteria uh, in the region so yeah uh, unfortunately uh, we lost him this is our first uh, loss uh, of confirmed snake bite uh, in malaysia for 2023 so we don't have many uh, uh, death from snake bite but this is a uh, related to snake bite uh, so um, still uh, it's a it's not good <laughs> because we are retargeting malaysia to be zero death from snake bite uh, okay um, yeah so that's from my take uh, maybe a early surgical intervention uh, is probably warranted and, and and the case in Kuantan uh, they did fasciotomy on this gentleman uh, and it only lasted for another 24 hours before he also demise because the spread was so high up to the shoulder and the chest area already mm -hmm. so very significant okay uh, do we have a confirmation about the uh, bacteria or uh, the blood culture uh, yeah, we uh, we have uh, the blood culture came out on the last slide, Aromanas. Yeah, so that's confirmed, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the blood. Uh, that's the blood culture. They didn't send any uh, experience CNS, but this yeah, was yeah. the CNS from the blood culture. Uh, yeah. So from. even from the blood culture early on, it shows already spillage of the bacteria into the circulation. So you know, it's very very significant um, septicemia. So the blood culture was was uh, uh, took uh, just in the very beginning. Yeah, I think early on, on day one, I think. The initial uh, ABC was normal, but subsequently dropping uh, the white cell count and pellet was uh, was dropping. Yeah, yeah. So that's a typical sign of sepsis, also, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What I mean is, uh, when was the culture done? The blood culture was taken on day two, on the eighth of uh, of May. Oh. Because right. patient had fever at uh, on the morning of the second day, so blood culture was withdrawn on the on the second day. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Prof and doc Doctor, for a great uh, discussion just now, and also thank you for Doctor Fidaus for the case presentation just now. So we have one question in the uh, chat box. So uh, my fellow friends, uh, medical student asking, what is the most appropriate first aid when beaten by snakes? How about sucking out venom? Tony K and apply us. Does it actually help? Yeah, all right. Uh, okay, for, for, from the uh, um, kind of a primary aid point of view, uh, yes, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, kind of uh, by uh, roadside interventions, which might be, uh, totally useless if it's not harmful. Um, I think a few of them, uh, it could be like uh, some of them, they just wrap uh, tight uh, um, above the bite side with the tourniquet or whatever is available, uh, hoping that this it might uh, stop the venom from spreading uh, proximally. The second one is uh, some of them, they might uh, use some sort of like cupping. That's like kind of, they assume that they will suck out the uh, venom from the wound side if they're able to determine where the wound is. And uh, the other thing is, um, this is uh, uh, from experience from back home. Um, whenever someone bitten by a snake, and instead of uh, rushing him or her to the hospital, basically, they look to the nearby uh, grasses or leaves or whatever it is. They chew it up and then they stick it into the one side. And they assume that that might help. So the issue is whatever the first one or the second or the third one is like uh, totally uh, not appropriate, totally wrong. Uh, I think uh, the most appro appropriate thing that we should do is to calm the, 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 the victim first. Um, the very next move will be try to immobilize the affected limb. For example, if uh, in the leg, 
uh, try to uh, rest the leg probably in something a bit solid. Probably you can just uh, wrap a bandage along the the whole leg, uh, hoping that will slow down the spread of the uh, venom uh, proximally. That might help. And then uh, the second move will going to be send him or her to the nearby uh, hospital. So what I meant to say is uh, definitely we need to get uh, the public uh, on board what to do when they first encounter those uh, kind of uh, unfortunate incidents. So uh, not just uh, uh, tying up the limbs, no kind of uh, putting any sort of uh, add-ons uh, uh, on, on top of the one side, uh, no cupping at all. Just try to immobilize, assure your, uh, the victim, and send him to nearest by uh, health facility, uh, facility. And that definitely will help. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for a clear explanation. So uh, maybe we have uh, other uh, comment from uh, panelists, if there's any. OK, so uh, we continue with the next session. So uh, next up, uh, so firstly, I would like to thank everyone for all your thoughts and also uh, creation that is given. And also thank you for panelists for your feedback and also respond and also uh, a great and clear explanation during the discussion as well. So it was a heads up, especially for me as an undergraduate medical student in which uh, we should uh, very thorough in uh, uh, history taking as well as examination. And also as mentioned by Prof. Shari just now, we can also put this uh, as differential di diagnosis. So in this, uh, in this uh, situation, uh, critical thinking is very important for us. So next up, we will have a Kahoot. Uh, we, will ha we will have a Kahoot uh, session. So um, we have prepared a quiz with a special prize for the winner. So uh, for the attendance, uh, for the students, you can please scan the QR code uh, or key in uh, the pin as shows to play uh, this uh, Kahoot session. So at the end of this quiz, we will display the QR code and also a link for the e-certificate. So uh, please stay tuned. So the third place goes to A168292269. Second place goes to A685A3 and the winner are... GA0998. So congratulations for this, uh, my fellow medical students. Okay, good job. Congratulations and well done for the winner. Okay, so we'll go back to the slides real quick. Good job, guys. I can see that you've read all the materials that we gave you. Okay, so what does the winner get? We need to play this video now. Let's see. So sorry, there's a bit of a uh, technical difficulty in terms of the internet, but basically the winner will receive a Land Snakes of Medical Significance in Malaysia 3rd edition book. And one of the authors is actually Prof. Khaldun, who is in our meeting with us today. So congratulations, and we will give you your gift later on. But okay, so uh, again, uh, we would like to thank uh, thank you so much to Associate Professor uh, Dr. Muhammad Hashairi Fauzi, Dr. York, Dr. Hassan, Adam, Dr. Nick, earlier today, Dr. Firdaus, as well as Associate Prof. Uh, Dr. Khaldun. Thank you so much for this great exposure into clinical toxinology here today. So I would like to uh, invite Prof. Khaldun to give us a little bit of a closing remark before we end today. Uh, okay, thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, for, for a very good uh, session. Another great uh, discussions with our panel. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for uh, responding to our invitation uh, for, for to this event. I would like to also uh, congratulate all our uh, 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 secretariat members who have been working very hard uh, off time, off, uh, off schedule. Uh, out of their own daily schedule uh, to make this happen. So we look forward for our last um, session uh, will be our uh, fourth uh, 
uh, addition uh, of this clinical toxinology for medical students in the next few months. So congratulations again to the winner of the Kahoot. I hope you uh, will get the book uh, in one piece. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much, Prof, for your words. And uh, we would like to extend our thanks as well from me and Hasim for uh, the opportunity to moderate this event today. Uh, Hasim, anything you want to say? So uh, I would like to thank to all panelists and also my fellow undergraduate medical students. So uh, today we learned so much uh, because this is our first exposure of clinical toxinology. So it's benefited us in terms of uh, exposure as well as awareness. So as a future medical doctor, we might uh, start to practice in terms of uh, clinical examination and also differential diagnosis in terms of managing patients. Okay. okay. All right, so congratulations and well done everyone for your effort. We hope that with this webinar and the Q&A session and the quiz that the medical students in attendance have managed to grasp some concepts pertaining to clinical toxinology. So it might be the first step of a long journey. Who knows, some of us may actually end up inspiring to fill the shoes of some of our panelists here today. So next, we would like to display our QR code and the link uh, for the e-certificate for the students, as well as the uh, QR code for the MMA CPD points. So I hope that uh, everyone has benefited from this session here today in widening perspectives and gaining knowledge. It was a pleasure to have all of you here today. Thank you for everyone's time and attention. Take care and have a good evening ahead. And please don't forget to scan the QR code and click on this link for any of the uh, ESITs as well as feedback and attendance. So we, will so we will also post up the link in the chat box. And once again, I would like to thank you so much for Associate Prof. Dr. Mohammad Hashari Fauzi, Dr. York, Dr. Hassan Adam, and Dr. Nick Azlan, Dr. Fidaus, and also Associate Prof. Dr. Kaldun. So it was an eye opener to hear from the views of experts. Thank you, Profs and Doctors. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.